So today's episode is on the newly listed Yatsen Group, which IPO'd just two weeks ago on the NYSE under ticker YSG. It wasn't the most hyped IPO, but it was still pretty hot. The company priced at the top of its range, raising over $600 million, and immediately saw a 75% boost on its first day of trading. It's since come down from that price, but it's still a nearly $12 billion market cap company. Not bad for a company that was founded in just 2016. Not bad at all. But you might be scratching your head and asking yourself, what is the Yatsen Group? Have Ying and Ray ever mentioned it before? How come you don't remember ever hearing about this company? And you'd be kind of right, because we really haven't focused on this company much, although we have had speakers who have mentioned it, such as Lauren Hallinan a few months ago in our episode 70 on live streaming e-commerce, and more recently this week on our Q3 Market Trends call with Big One Labs' Meng Yao Ren. But even when they did, it wasn't under the name Yatsen Group. That's because, more likely than not, you were hearing about one of their brands instead, and probably one in particular, their most successful and biggest brand to date, Perfect Diary, or Wanmei Zhiji. Yeah, Yatsen does also own several other brands, like Little Andine and Abby's Choice, but those are less than two years old. So unless you're a cosmetic super fan, a Cai Zhuang Kong, then you probably definitely haven't heard of them. That explains, though, why the company decided to go public under the parent entity Yatsen Group. Named after the founder's shared alma mater, Sun Yat-sen University in Guangdong province, which itself is named after the revolutionary leader Sun Yat-sen, Yatsen Group doesn't just want to be known for one brand, of course. It wants to own a whole portfolio of awesome brands, like the company we reference in the title of this episode, L'Oreal. Yep, that's pretty much been how the company has been covered in Chinese media. Yatsen's tagline is usually, China's L'Oreal, but for the digital age. In today's episode, we'll see just how close to being true that is, and what exactly is so special about this company, if anything. Uh, the president's key economic team goes to China. Uh, after a whole night thinking, I say, I still want to do it. <laughs> We are Tech Buzz China by Pan Daily, powered by the Seneca Podcast Network by SubChina. We're a bi weekly podcast focused on giving you a peek into what's buzzing within the tech community in China. We uncover and contextualize unique insights, perspectives, and takeaways on headline tech news that don't always make it into English language coverage, so you can be smarter about the world of China tech. Tech Buzz China is a part of Pandaily.com, an English language site that tells you everything about China's innovation. I am one of your two co-hosts, Ying Lu. And I'm your other co-host, Ray Ma. By the way, we launched, or maybe relaunched is the better word, our YouTube channel. Subscribe to us to get the latest episodes and also some YouTube-only content that we'll be putting up, like our investor webinar with Big One Labs on Q3 China market trends. That happened this week. <laughs> Extra bonus, Big One actually shares some very timely data on Yatsen on the call. Be sure to log in. The webinar will only be up for one week. Finally, we are, as always, still looking for more reviews on Apple Podcasts. Send either of us a screenshot of your review, and we will gift you a free three-month subscription to our Extra Buzz newsletter. You can send me an email at ying at techbuzzchina.com. Several of you have already claimed this, and we really love it when you do. Thanks so much. All right, so let's start with the founding story, which is pretty easy to find since the company is so new and has honestly been pretty fantastic with PR since the very beginning. So let's go with Yatsen's so-called Ling Hun Ren Wu, or key man, Huang Jianfeng, or David Huang. David is Yatsen's chairman, CEO, and controlling shareholder, and he's also the main founder. He owns 28% of the company, so he's worth $3 billion and he's only 37. As we now know, every one of the founding team graduated from Sun Yat-sen University. 
David studied international commerce and trade there and graduated in 2007. He joined P&G. That's Procter and Gamble, the American multinational consumer goods corporation, straight out of school. And he worked there for three years as a market research manager. And that's where he learned how to work with data, apparently, because data analytics is an important part of this business, and something the company cites over and over in its prospectus as enabling it to predict consumer trends. It seems that he truly excelled at his job. Because even today, if you search online for guides to getting a marketing job at P&G China, you'll probably be led to one of his old blogs titled "Wo Yan Zhong de Bao Jie CMK" or "P&G's Consumer and Market Knowledge Division in My Eyes." In it, he explains with clarity how the company thinks about how to conduct market research and use data. I mean, everyone uses data these days, but it is true that six percent of Yatsen's employees work in data analytics, which is apparently much higher than the industry average. So the company does take it seriously. Anyway, after P&G, it seems that the startup bug then caught David because he then left the comforts of working for an MNC and joined a domestic face mask brand, Unifon. That's Unifon for a year. Before he went to Boston for an MBA at Harvard Business School, and we don't know for sure, but it looks like sometime in the middle of his MBA in late 2013, he went to Bob Xu at Gen Fund, one of the top seed funds in China, and talked about starting a company. Bob was super interested, but felt that David was still lacking experience, and so told him that he could give him a million dollars then and there because the young man had a good shot and was exactly the type of foreign educated but locally savvy entrepreneur he liked. But that, if he was being honest, David should probably go and continue working at Unifon for a few years before striking out on his own. So timelines get a little murky here, but according to the IPO prospectus, David didn't leave Unifon until 2016, and at least as of his departure, he was the company's COO. In fact, he's often listed as one of its co-founders. Though Unifon's history is not that straightforward, the brand made a few big pivots since its true inception date, so I don't think that title is really accurate. But All you have to remember is that Unifon is one of the earliest domestic D to C brands in China, and so before Perfect Diary was an e-commerce darling, yep, there was Unifon, and it has continued to do fine. It's not a big company or anything, but it's listed in China and currently has a market cap of about one billion dollars. It's also profitable, albeit mildly, and had the distinction of winning investment from Xiaomi's Lei Jun after just a five-minute chat. Our point: it was kind of a big deal in this niche, and for sure, having five years of working experience here was one of David's biggest selling points. So, since David had already gotten Bob's blessing three years earlier, he went and pitched Gen Fund again in 2016, when he was really ready to start the company for real. According to Gen Fund, after talking for less than an hour face to face, only 15 minutes elapsed between the CEO Anna Fong receiving David's business plan and her sending him their term sheet. That's a super high conviction bet there. I mean, it's not like David was just going there with a PowerPoint. He had apparently already put together a team of twenty, including two other Yatsen University alumni as well as his wife, and everyone was working full time already without any funding secured. And the intention was clear: they were going to create a domestic Chinese L'Oreal. You know, the two hundred billion dollar market cap multinational cosmetics giant. That seems to have been the goal from the very beginning. But why the focus on being a domestic Chinese brand? Well, that's pretty easy to answer, and we might as well take a little detour here. It's because by then it was starting to be obvious that domestic brands could resonate emotionally with certain customers, and it was quickly becoming a plus to be a domestic brand, not a minus. Yeah, if we were restricted to using two hashtags to describe Yatsen's offerings, they would be. Hashtag DTC and hashtag Chinese brand. You see, there is a lot of hype in English about Perfect Diary's digital DNA, which isn't to say that's not how it's known in China too. But there, there's also a lot more chatter about the company's status as a leading domestic brand or 国货 
In fact, that was really one of the core value propositions of Unifon. Its brand story was about how there was this little town in Hunan province whose residents had discovered that the mud around the area had these amazing restoration powers for their skin. So much so that the imperial palace began asking for it. You know how Western and luxury brands are really good at crafting brand origin stories with hundreds of years of history? Well, for a long time, Chinese brands were pretty lacking on this front. But then they learned to storytell too. So here we are. Yeah, brands like Unifon were really playing up their Chinese-ness, and it was good timing to do so, because for the past decade, there's been rising nationalism in China, especially amongst youth. And by the way, that's only been accelerated by the trade war. Not surprisingly, some brands said that the younger their customers are, the more they are drawn to domestic brands. That extends to food as well, with brands like Three Squirrels, which we covered back in Tech Buzz episode 48, seeing tremendous support from this demographic. But back to 2017, the first year of Perfect Diary's existence. The market is actually not as friendly as it is today to local brands. And by the way, even today, with China in COVID recovery mode and support for domestic brands as high as it's ever been, the number for those preferring local brands is still just barely over 50%. But in 2017, obviously, that was much lower. So unfortunately for Perfect Diary, a not-so-great product launch and less enthusiasm from domestic brands meant that it was pretty far away from knocking it out of the ballpark. Follow-on investment was looking not so easy to get. Luckily for David and team, the partner they had to impress at GenFund this time was Dai Yusen, a co-founder of Jumei, once upon a time China's biggest online cosmetics platform and a publicly listed company on the NYSE. Yusen was concerned about the lackluster launch, but not overly so. This team definitely had a chance to become China's L'Oreal, he thought. So GenFund continued to invest, holding on to its 10% ownership into the IPO. It is the second largest shareholder behind Hill House. Right. So even though GenFund really did take a lot of risk initially, and, you know, Yatsen didn't start off as being a very hot deal, eventually it did get Hill House, which has been going into early stage the last few years. And Hill House is you know, one of the best investment funds in China. Uh, But even the Hill House partner who invested said the same thing about the company. The numbers weren't good, but David was impressive. So for everyone involved, it seemed that this was pretty much purely a bet on the founders. I mean, let's again go back to 2017 and consider what was happening at the time. There were already quite a few DTC, or at least Taobao slash Tmall only cosmetic brands in China. Remember, David's old company, Unifon, was one of the more successful ones in this space. And international brands were also very dominant. There was an abundant room for Perfect Diary to grow. So as we mentioned, Perfect Diary didn't do that great its first year. In 2018, however, it changed tactics. Or it didn't change tactics so much as saw an opportunity. And that opportunity was Xiao Hongshu, aka Red, which is a content e-commerce platform that we've covered in the past on TechBuzz way back in episode 31. In fact, some folks will call Yatsen the first IPO of the Xiao Hongshu ecosystem. I think that's an exaggeration, but it's not completely unwarranted. This is not an episode on Xiao Hongshu, so we won't go over it here, except to say that one way of describing it in the West has been Instagram and Pinterest sprinkled with a dose of Taobao. And 2018 just so happened to be the year of Xiao Hongshu. Seriously. I mean, that's the year we covered it here on TechBuzz as well. And as luck would have it, Perfect Diary went all in on Xiao Hongshu at just the right time, right around early 2018, after seeing that its customers were sharing their experiences with the product on the platform. I mean, their strategy was solid, but wasn't all that special. They would provide the influencers with all the talking points, but then give these influencers autonomy on how to present the content in their own authentic voice. Another thing that Yatsung was super good at was identifying what I would call nano influencers. So folks who didn't have that many followers, but who had a great relationship with their fans and had their trust. And all this was super effective. 
It quickly catapulted Perfect Diary into the top seller in its category on Tmall. In 2018, for Singles Day, it was the undisputed number one in domestic cosmetic brands and the second overall. It broke through 100 million RMB. That's about 15 million dollars in sales in less than 90 minutes. In 2019, the following year, it would smash its own record by getting to that same number in sales, 15 million dollars, in just 13 minutes. And then, of course, remaining as the category number one for much of the year as well. Sure, there are tricks, including lots of pre-sales that happen and crazy promotions, in order to achieve these kinds of numbers. All of which we've talked about on our episode on Singles Day. That's episode twenty-nine. But that doesn't really diminish Perfect Diary's runaway success. So, besides being great with KOLs and relatively early to leverage Xiao Hongshu, what else did the brand do right? Well, it's many awesome collaborations for one. One interesting thing to note about Perfect Diary, although it is a guohuo or domestic brand, it actually collaborated the most often with non-Chinese IP. Why is that? Well, it's quite consistent with the brand's own origin story, right? The brand's self-introduction goes something like this: a Harvard-educated founder meets a trendy designer in exotic London, and they conspire to bring the best of Western cosmetics back to Asia, spawning the creation of Perfect Diary. No, really, that is the brand legend. Even though we know that isn't how it all happened, but the collabs are still cool. For example, Perfect Diary worked with the British Museum to do a palette inspired by Majolica ceramics. They also launched a series of lipsticks inspired by classic paintings from the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York City. And my personal favorite was an eyeshadow collaboration with the Discovery Channel, invoking the colors of wild animals. That campaign was probably the first time I took a serious look at Perfect Diary, actually. And was like, these guys are marketing geniuses. I mean, the whole thing looked pretty upscale and sophisticated, but at just thirty dollars, it was cheap enough to buy on a whim. Okay, so it's not like super, super cheap. But for those of you who don't buy cosmetics, a similarly sized YSL palette will cost you three to four times as much. And while Perfect Diary doesn't advertise this per se, it's well known that they use the same ODMs as the big brands. Remember from our last episode that ODM stands for Original Design Manufacturer, and for Yatsen, their top three ODMs, Cosmax, Intercos, and Idofec. I might be pronouncing those wrong. Count Estee Lauder, Dior, YSL, and other premium international. Brands. Brands amongst their clientele. In order to have as much of a smooth workflow as possible with these various ODMs, Yatsen hires quite a few on-site representatives called 驻场代表 so as to facilitate easier communication. While this is pretty common, Yatsen seems to have done this to a greater degree than many of its MNC competitors, or at least that's what some suspect as being the reason behind one of its greatest feats. The launch of nearly 1,000 SKUs on its Tmall store in just one year, which is like twice as high as some of its foreign competition. Now, because Yatsen does everything through ODMs, though, of course there are some folks who are like, why not just invest in the ODMs? I believe that the Chinese cosmetics market will grow, but how do I know that Yatsen will be the winner? We hear that a lot, and it's not untrue. I mean, don't think someone else can't do to Perfect Diary what Perfect Diary has done to the international brands. You can easily find clones of Perfect Diary products at even more reduced prices, but the packaging and product can look virtually identical. So this is where the quality of the ODMs will matter, hopefully, because these are products people are putting on their faces, after all. But it's also why the marketing and branding really matter. In addition to online influencers. Yatsen has also spent big bucks on celebrity endorsements. We're not going to name them all here, but there's just been a ton of them, especially ones favored by Gen Z and younger millennials. And these endorsements have been very, very helpful. But, and there's always a but, right? 
because I think we've given you a pretty good idea of what Yatsen, and specifically its first brand, Perfect Diary, has been able to accomplish. But things are not all so rosy. For one, the company lost money this year after eking out a tiny profit last year. For the first nine months, it lost $169 million on net revenues of $481 million. That's a negative 35% net margin. And growth has slowed down. Although it's just a four year old company, so I think a 73% year on year growth still seems pretty good. It's just that a lot of people are more concerned about the fact that after doing so well in the 2018 and 2019 singles day extravaganzas, Perfect Diary didn't even make it into the top 10 for Alibaba's cosmetics and skincare category this year. Well, to be absolutely fair, it was number nine last year, and the category does combine skincare and cosmetics, and skincare dominates in terms of GMV, so it's not too weird that Perfect Diary didn't make it. But what we just said should also give you some pause. Because Yatsin obviously knows that the skincare category is bigger, David worked at Unifon after all, and so it's launched a new brand called Abby's Choice that has skincare as a big component in addition to makeup. But if you look at the T Mall Singles Day bestsellers of the last four years, foreign brands have done increasingly better, not worse. So, is there a reason to think Yatsin will buck the trend? No idea, but they're up against some very, very stiff competition. Right. And even when you look at the cosmetic subcategory leaderboards, while it is true that Perfect Diary did still come out at number one this year for eyeshadow and lipstick, well, We have the question if the cost of those wins might have been too much. I mean, let's look at the JD created June 18th shopping festival this year, which is quickly becoming the other big day to watch for consumer brands. So this year, Perfect Diary took the crown at number one, beating out Florisys or Hua Xizi, which is a fast rising local brand that ended up at number two. But if you look at the numbers in detail, it doesn't look so great. Apparently, Perfect Diary had to discount goods by more than 60% in order to move that much volume. Whereas Florisys got to number two with just 13% off on average. And if you attended our investor webinar with Big One Lab this week, you'll know that the latest data doesn't look great either. T Mall GMV in Q3 shows that Perfect Diary is declining, whereas Florisys is gaining. Of course, this is just T Mall, and there are still other channels, such as Douyin, which just went independent. And for Perfect Diary, it's estimated that about 15% of its sales is from private traffic, such as its own WeChat mini program. But T Mall is for sure its biggest channel still, for most brands really, and still should be the one to watch if you want just to have one number to chew on. Well, one of the reasons people are citing is because Perfect Diary might have been slower than the other brands to invest heavily in short video and live streaming. I mean, supposedly because the brand was so successful in Xiaohongshu, it didn't experiment as aggressively on Douyin and other platforms and lost out on some of the early traffic to its competitors. Now, I don't have the exact data to be able to quantify this, but The shift from Xiaohongshu to Taobao live streaming and Douyin short videos was indeed really, really fast. So I wouldn't be surprised if that happened. Secondly, the brand has been accused of being a little too clever with its marketing. Anything from selling $12 lipsticks that people realize later is actually much smaller than they expected or is normal sized, to having lots of what people have complained are fake reviews, paid fans, and spam bots. The latter really isn't exclusive to Yatsin, though, and plagues many consumer platforms and brands in China, so it's not that alarming. Yeah, it sucks, but such aggressive marketing and sales tactics are commonplace. The government is coming in with some harsh regulations on this, especially around e commerce live streaming, but I don't think it'll be that easy to eradicate. Still, I think the biggest problem is going to be the competition. We already mentioned Florisys, the company nipping at Perfect Diary's heels. But also, there's just the increasing cost of acquiring customers online. Online sales accounted for over 86% of the revenues for this year, but Yatsen has already been building offline stores and acquiring customers that way. Yatsen began the stores in 2019 and already has over 200 stores in 90 cities in China, an increase from 40 stores just a year ago. 
I've never been inside of one, but the photos look pretty cool. The story goes that Hill House's Zhang Lei, Yatsen's biggest institutional shareholder, told David to definitely build offline stores during a ski trip together in 2018. Except that it shouldn't be any old store, but a place where girls could quickly become beautiful. I'm not quite sure what he means by that, but I think he's referring to the many makeup counters they have at these stores, where consumers are shown how to use the products they want to buy. So investors, that's where a lot of your money will be invested. Offline experience stores, well, those and acquisitions. Yatsen's already announced the acquisition of a French brand and is close, apparently, to acquiring another Chinese skincare brand. I mean. This isn't that surprising. It's literally a page out of the L'Oreal playbook. That company has made a ton of acquisitions over the years. Will it really become China's L'Oreal, though? We thought it's way too early to tell, so we wanted to ask some industry experts and see what they thought. We asked Mark Tanner from Shanghai. Mark, why don't you introduce yourself? Hi, I'm Mark Tanner, and I'm the founder and managing director of Shanghai-based China Skinny. Um, we do a lot of market research, market strategy, branding, new product development in China, which often involves looking at best practice in market, evaluating, auditing other brands as well as our clients' brands, and obviously、uh, with the success of Yatsen and, and some of their brands, such as Perfect Diary,、uh, we've done a lot of a lot of audits of how they're succeeding in the market in China. We subscribe to the China Skinny newsletter and actually really enjoy reading it. It's great for consumer trends, and since so much is e-commerce these days, there's a bunch of that as well. So go to chinaskinny.com to sign up. Okay, so Mark, the question that everyone always asks about Yatsen, it's not the most original question, but we'd be remiss if we didn't ask it. Do you think Yatsen can be the L'Oreal of China? I think in the short term,、uh, Yatsen becoming the next L'Oreal is a bit of a long shot.、Uh, they are effectively just a, a marketing company. It does a bit of contract manufacturing, but they are obviously with the IPO.、Um, they're going to invest some of that in, in really growing the depth and breadth of the company, such as offline.、Um, they're acquiring so, some great companies from from abroad、uh, that will bring in some R and D, intelligence, and expertise. Um, but if if you look at the way Chinese companies are, the way they operate, they are incredibly nimble, and they they're not prepared to fail、um, or try new things. So I think that approach will、uh, will help them in the medium term to really grow、um, and and really take on some of the bigger beauty players.、Um, but but they do have a long way to go、um, before they're there. But never write off a Chinese company. They're they're incredibly ambitious and have some some great traits. Okay, so we're not crazy here, and we think it's too early as well. Funny that you call it just a marketing company that does a bit of contract manufacturing. We've definitely heard that characterization. Since you're the marketing expert here, do you have some more detail to offer on exactly how Yatsen got to its current level of success? I think a lot of Yatsen's success can be put down to just really understanding the market, the channels, and and the landscape, and really. Adapting and trying new things that really play on that understanding.、Um, they were really early with a lot of trends in China, such as the KOL movement.、Uh, they were quick to jump on that, and, and particularly the grassroots, the key, key opinion consumers.、Uh, they've, they've used about fifteen thousand KOLs、um, since since beginning, so really effective at that. I think another thing that that is a real strength is they aren't dependent on. Uh, those those platforms such as Alibaba and JD,、um, they've used them really well to to build awareness and and encourage trial. But they've they've really、uh, won a lot of them over and created loyal customers that bypass that middleman or middle platform, and really、uh, gained a lot of market intelligence and customer ownership, and obviously have much higher margins as a result. So overall, they've they've really Adapted to the Chinese landscape, well appealed to Chinese consumers as both a Chinese brand, but with the international、um, angle, with both their partnerships from the likes of Discovery Channel, National Geographic, etc., and also some of the OEMs that do the manufacturing. 
So really uh, a very modern contemporary company that, that's playing to the trends and, and I'm sure will continue to do so. Thanks, Mark. That was really helpful. Um, I think the point about platforms is really important to highlight here. Although what I want to say is that I don't think they're quite as independent as they claim. That's because if you read the Yatsen prospectus, the 23 million DTC customers they claim actually include Tmall store customers. They aren't all customers through private traffic like WeChat mini programs and self-branded sites like I was expecting. In fact, that kind of traffic, like we said earlier, is estimated to be only about 15% of sales. And even the prospectus says quite matter-of-factly that Tmall actually accounts for the majority of its revenues. It didn't break down more specifically than that, but yeah, a majority. Yeah, but the industry doesn't consider Tmall a marketplace, only JD and VIP shop. So technically, Yetsin is correct. Even though when I visit Tmall, I really don't see how it's not a marketplace. Maybe a better indicator would be to see how effectively Yetsin can grow that private traffic. And it's certainly trying to do so with WeChat group chats and chatbots, but that could backfire, as some customers are already finding it too spammy. What we do know is that its share of sales through private traffic is in line with other leading DTC brands in China for now. And who knows, maybe China and the West will stay divergent in this respect. Maybe the DTC brands continue to grow on top of Tmall and never become really independent. I agree. The ecosystems are indeed very different. You can review our episode 75 on e-commerce SaaS if you're confused. Although, personally, I'm pretty bullish on the independent private traffic ecosystem. But anyway, back to the topic at hand. Let's summarize what we learned today. Yatsen Group was founded in 2016 and is trying to be the L'Oreal of China, but for the digital age. Which means that they began with launching DTC brands. And their first one, Perfect Diary, which focuses on cosmetics, pretty much single-handedly propelled the company to an IPO last month on the NYSE, where it's sitting pretty at a market cap of $11 billion. They've both acquired and relaunched, as well as created new brands from scratch since then. Little Undine, Abby's Choice, and Galenic Paris, if you're curious. But most of its 23.5 million DTC customers are devotees of Perfect Diary, which was designed for Gen Z. Perfect Diary's claim to fame is that it uses the same ODMs as the major brands like Estee Lauder or YSL, so you're getting high-quality products and exquisite packaging, but of course at a lower price, like half or less for mass appeal. Oh, and they're super trendy and launch a ton of products, like this constant stream of new SKUs. So founder CEO David Huang had already worked at both P&G and a successful local DTC brand previously so he had a good idea of what he was doing. It still wasn't easy though, since the category as a whole was very, very competitive. However, Perfect Diary's speed of launch, innovative collaborations, and savvy digital marketing really made it stand out. Specifically, it invested heavily in working with influencers on Xiaohongshu, aka Red, which is a really popular content-powered e-commerce platform. It also claims to use lots of data, in fact, it mentions data analytics as a key competitive advantage a bunch of times in its IPO prospectus. Anyway, by the end of 2019, last year, the company was nearing half a billion dollars of revenue. But we're seeing some brand fatigue, or something, because it seems to be ceding some market share to domestic competitors like Color Key and the slightly more upscale Floresis, at least on Tmall, its biggest channel. And while growing nationalism as well as improved branding and product quality have made local Chinese brands much more palatable to consumers, especially younger ones, foreign brands still present very stiff competition, especially when it comes to skincare. The quality factor and brand name are still there. People are careful about what they put on their face. The path to L'Oreal is going to require a lot of investment. Yatsen is building out its own manufacturing facility in a JV with one of its top ODMs. And it's also opening hundreds of offline experience stores. Same as we've seen many DTC brands do here in the US. And if it wants to be a multi-brand big company like L'Oreal, 
it's also got to make some acquisitions, which is what it's doing. All of this is very expensive, which is probably why the company is pretty unprofitable at the moment. But it's got some big believers. Hill House, for one, is its largest institutional investor, and seems to believe in its L'Oreal dreams. I don't suppose Hill House would tell us even if it didn't. And however you look at it, Yatsen does have a lot of challenges in front of it. Three Squirrels, the DTC snack brand we covered in episode 48, still seems to be doing okay. But Handu or Handu Yishu in Chinese, one of the early successes in apparel DTC brands, hasn't. In 2014, it was the best-selling apparel brand on Tmall, not just for Singles Day but for the entire year. This year, though, it's nowhere to be seen and has scrapped plans for an IPO. Yeah, at least for the apparel category, we already see that offline brands who have reoriented themselves to the new e-commerce landscape are the real winners. It seems that it's easier for the old offline brands to learn how to sell online than for the new digitally native brands to learn how to manage supply chains and provide customer service. Will this also happen in the cosmetics and skincare industry? I mean, is there any reason to suppose it can't? Offline brands versus DTC aside, Chinese brands are moving up the value chain. Really, they are. Yeah, there's still going to be a bunch of unpronounceable, direct from factory brands on Amazon and Wish and whatnot with questionable quality. But there are going to be more and more of these genuinely very well designed, very well thought out brands that have well, not top top, but better and better quality. So, what do you think, guys? Have you bought any Yatsen products? Maybe been to one of their stores? Have a point of view on the company going forward, or maybe on one of their competitors like Florisys? Or how about the trend of rising domestic Chinese consumer brands in general? Do you agree with what China Skinny's Mark Tanner said about Yatsen being basically a marketing company? If you do, definitely reach out, email us, tweet at us, and let us know. Thanks for listening, and don't forget to write us that review for your free Extra Buzz subscription. Have any questions or suggestions? Email us. We really enjoyed putting this together, and we're always open to any questions or suggestions. You can find us on Twitter at the Pan Daily, at Tech Buzz China, and my personal Twitter account is spelled Y I N G L U two zero two zero. And my Twitter is spelled R U I M A. Tech Buzz China by Pan Daily is powered by the Seneca Podcast Network on Sub China. PanDaily dot com is an English language site that tells you everything about China's innovation. Our producers are Tsai Weichun and Kaiser Kuo. Thank you for listening. <laughs>